Hello everybody, and welcome to LMM. In this episode of Laurie Goes Loco, we have crossed the channel to Belgium to come here at Meldigum, which is a steam museum that runs from here to a place called Iglo, which I like to call Iglo. And we've come here to look at one of the mainstay of their steam fleet, which funny enough is a steam locomotive built in England. This is WD196. And you might be thinking, I think I've seen that before. And that I think you might well be correct. First of all, it's an austerity of which there were 485 made and I think 70 have survived into preservation, which is quite a good number of locos, which means you may have seen one kicking around at your local preserve railway. This one, however, especially if you like your older films, you would have definitely seen before. For this is the locomotive that starred in Centrinian's The Great Train Robbery, not the modern remake, the, the original. But most importantly, and most especially, this is the locomotive that you can see in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Now, I can't show you that clip because of YouTube and yeah, copyright and everything. But if you pause at this moment, I promise I'll stand right here and you could just search in the browser for steam train Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and you'll see this thing trundling along in a totally different color with a utterly ridiculous chimney strapped onto it, making it look older and um, less good. But that's, that's what it is. This is quite a, a famous austerity. Also, it is an austerity, not a J94. Lots of people seem to get these confused and say, oh, it's a J94. That was the LNER version of this, and only ones that actually were owned and used by the LNER. Uh, this actually was built after the LNER. This was built in 1953, so it's after the LNER, so it can't ever actually be a J94. She weighs 49 tonnes. So that works out roughly per axle of about 13.6 tonnes per axle. And of that, about two and a bit tonnes is coal. And she will hold in that colossal saddle tank up there about five and a half thousand litres of water. The cylinders on this are hidden inside the frames along with the valve gear. We only got the coupling rods on the outside. But the cylinders are 18 inches by 26 inches. And combined with the four foot three driving wheels, it produces attractive effort of 23,870 whatever you measure attractive effort in, which is a fair amount for a, a little 060. Now, it is a very, very instantly recognisable design. This was basically the site of almost every heritage railway, one of these and a train of Mark I coaches. So the most obvious question is, why on earth is there one here in Belgium? Because it's not what you'd initially expect to have a British engine over here. So I'm going to dive into a bit of the history now and all will become clear to why this is in Belgium and why it's actually totally correct to have this like this over here. She is number 3796 of 1953 and she's part of the very last batch of locomotives ordered by the Royal Army Corps of Transport or some variation of that name. And she's number six of that last batch of which there were 14 locomotives ordered. And this particular batch has survived remarkably well in preservation, with nine of them still around. I think, if memory serves, it's 199-200-201-202-203 was scrapped, and 194, I think, was scrapped. And then 192 and 198, I think they're still around on the Isle of Wight Steam Railway, and I think one of them went to the Kenton East Sussex Railway, and the other ones are somewhere... And of which I totally forget where they are. But that's pretty good odds for that kind of batch. So the question is, why were steam engines ordered so late on by the Ministry of Defence? Which kind of raises quite a good question. But basically, they were to be used for training and to be put into strategic reserve because it was now the height of the Cold War. And these kind of things could be a very useful thing to have if everything went to, well, went down the pan. 196 was delivered brand new to Longmore in the March of 1953 and at that time she was in black. That was the livery that Hanslet painted all the austerities in for this service, just plain online black. And she went straight into storage, which seems a really weird thing, doesn't it, to have a brand new out-of-the-box steam engine and to immediately put it into store, don't use it at all. And it was in fact in storage for almost two years, coming back out in the June of 1955, where she went to the Bychester Military Railway in Oxfordshire, where she was serving the depot at Lower Arncott. Now, 
Her service in this place was a long and arduous one, lasting for just a few months because in October she went back into storage. Which again seems a rather <laughs> pointless thing, doesn't it? It was out for just a few months, this brand new steam engine, and then, ah, now nah, we'll, we'll stick that away, we don't need that anymore. In 1957, she was taken out of storage, and she survived a few years of running at Long Marston before she moved back to Bychester in 1960. In 1964, she moved again, this time to where she would become really famous among railway enthusiasts, to the Longmore Military Railway. And in the following year, she got repainted again out of the famous blue livery into a pseudo British railway livery as 68011. And that's the, the guys it carried to be in the great train robbery, the St. Trinian's film I told you about earlier. Two years later, after her initial starring role, she was repainted again back into Elmar Blue for the use in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, along with, as I said, this really stupid chimney. And if you haven't already gone and check out the clip, it's well worth doing. And this was the gaze that she kind of carried for the rest of her service. At Longmore, she was used regularly on the open days alongside the 210 austerity Gordon, which is preserved at the Seven Valley Railway. And these two engines performed most of the services running out of lists along the railway for the enthusiast open days. So if any of you guys remember visiting the Longmore Military Railway during its open days, and you remember an austerity, it was probably this one that pulled you. She does actually have a name. She's Errol Lonsdale, named after the last transport in chief. And she's the last locomotive to be named after a transport in chief in the army tradition, as it was army tradition to name locomotives after commanders, famous figureheads and things like that. She didn't carry the name long, however, because the railway closed down in 1970. So it was a short but illustrious career with a, a very nice name and a nice livery. From the railway's closure, she moved to the Kent and East Sussex Railway, and she was there for about two years. The locomotive was in working condition. It left as a working engine, and it went to the railway as a working engine. Her stay at Keswell was quite short before she moved on to the mid Hans Railway. It was during this that they had a big ceremony, and they officially renamed her again Errol Lonsdale, with the Major General himself coming along to personally rename the engine that carried his name which was a really lovely and fitting touch to it. In the early 1990s, she moved to the South Devon Railway, where she saw a lot of service until about 2002. And during this time, she was repainted again back to her fictitious BR livery as the locomotive in the Uchinian's Great Train Robbery as uh, 68011. In 2009, she changed hands again to be owned by the, the chap who owns her now. And they decided they were going to bring her back here to Belgium which means that she is the first austerity to make the crossing over the channel since the War Department engines did in 1947. On arrival here, they set about giving the locomotive an, an overhaul. It wasn't a restoration job. She'd been a good running locomotive before, but the 10 year ticket was up and they took the opportunity to do some bottom end work to make her a really top notch engine. At the same time, they took the opportunity to fit an air pump on the side, which is hidden just in front of the forward driving wheels, because everything over here on the continent runs on air brakes rather than vacuum that we use in the UK. So in order to haul trains over here, it had to be fitted with air brakes. And so they made the necessary modifications in the cab and put the plumbing in to facilitate that. It was at the request of the railway that they repainted it into this, which is the green that locomotives carried during the war years when we sent locomotives over here to help. And she was repainted with the crest of Field Marshal Montgomery's 21st Armoured. And it was a, a tradition of WD locomotives to carry a crest relating to something, yeah, to time with the, the army thing, to have like a, a mascot engine, if you will. And so that's the livery that she now carries. The problem being with this, that locomotives of that period had a WD number of five digits. Post-war, they only had a number of three digits. So WD196 is the wrong number for a locomotive carrying this livery. So the owner had the idea to add 75 to the beginning of the number, making this WD75196, because that's an appropriate looking number and also that made it the right style of number for this. And with a little bit of research, it transpires that, that was actually the number of a war department locomotive of an austerity that worked over here in Belgium during the war. So by a, a kind of a turn of fate, it's actually a very appropriate number, livery and condition for this locomotive to be wearing over here because precisely one of these worked just like this during the war. So an English locomotive in Belgium is actually 100% truly authentic. The original 75196 had made its journey from Southampton to France and from there it was loaned to Belgian Railways to help 
make up for the massive losses that they'd taken during the war. And it survived helping Belgian railways until 1947, where it returned to the UK from Zeebrugge, or Zeebrugge, to Harwich. This one went from Tilbury to Zeebrugge, because that's actually not that far away from where we are now. And that really makes it a lovely full circle of locomotives traveling across. It's a really nice kind of end to the story. Since this one's come here, it has been the mainstay of the locomotive fleet here. It runs most of the passenger trains and it's a perfect sized locomotive for the length of line here. The railway here is about 10 kilometers and this is just perfect. It can handle any of the trains that they ask to throw at it. It's a remarkably easy locomotive to use and it's well liked by all the crews. It's really quite nice and a bit unusual to have a locomotive that wasn't actually built in the country representing and running the railway over here. And of course, it is such an important part of both our heritage and the Belgian heritage. So with the basic history and what it is done, it is a horrible, horrible morning. But it sounds like the wind is dropping and the sun's coming out. So we're going to get the diesel out and we're going to draw it outside into the light and hopefully avoid the rain, which is threatening to come. And we're going to go have a look in the cab at what everything in there does. But before we can go through the controls on the footplate, I've got to get a fire lit. So that means I need to rake through the remnants of the warming fire. So that's getting rid of any of the ash and unburnt bits of coal ready to light a new fire. We start off by putting a ring of coal round the firebox and then we fill in the rest of the space with wood and get a, a nice covering, making sure it's all covered. And then we can light the fire. The important thing here is to try and get lots of your rags in lots of different places. You don't want just one bit of burn. You want it to be spread out throughout the fire, burning in lots of different places. And once it's burning, more coal. And now that looks like it's a light, let's look at the cab. So welcome to the cab of the austerity. And the first thing you'll notice is it's a relatively spacious cab for when it was in use and you had a two person crew. This was actually plenty of space. There is enough room to swing a shovel successfully to feed the firebox and enough room for the driver to move around. Certainly for me and Matt being up here, plenty of space. When you start bringing in an extra person of a cleaner, that still works. And then if you add in more people past that, well, then it starts becoming quite cozy. Most of you by now will be quite familiar with a cab and know what most things are. For instance, the regulator is here, the reverser is here. We have an injector here and here with the water feed for the injector there and on the same side, my side. The control up here, that's for the steam heat and we have a gauge up there for steam heat. And then we have a manifold shut off there, whistle control here, move them out this way. The gauge glasses and their shut offs. Here we have the steam feed for the air pump because it's an air brake locomotive. This control here is for my blower and this one here is to operate the sanders. We have cylinder cocks here which are currently open and then down by the base of the fire we have the dampers for rear and front. So rear's near you, front's near me. The things that you may be less familiar with, certainly on an austerity, are when we come over to here. So generally speaking when they were built these things were not air braked so here we have the air brake for the locomotive this one works just on us and then this control here presently with a pin in so it's isolated is the air brake for the train and then we have the train pipe reservoir and the main reservoir shown on this gauge here with two needles presently we have nothing on the system so they're both at zero but that will show us our break how much air we've got and how much air we're actually applying and then that one there is for the local break the thing which is very much 
not a common feature on a locomotive that we're used to is this little arrangement. We have a speedo here, apparently taken from a boat. It's GPS, uh, well, it works using GPS, so it gives a very accurate speed. And in there, there is also a reporter. So that reports our location and our speed back to HQ, so they know where we are and how fast we're going at all times. And we also have a wonderful array of switches here, which came off a World War II aircraft. And they have the most amazing action of throwing them over. And this works the lights at the front and the back of the locomotive because it's been upgraded with LED lighting. And that is really, they're quite cool. I like them a lot. But it is a requirement over here that a locomotive must have a speedo and it must record where it is. So even the steam engine like this working on a preserved private network still has to have that. Oh, and there we have a, a list here of telling us what all the things are. So one is emergency flashing, two is intensity, three is headlights onto red, three and four is headlights white. So if I do that, that will turn the headlights on at the front to be white. And doing just that, that puts the headlights to red. Because obviously when we work in reverse, we want things in red. Now the power for all of this comes off a battery that's mounted on that side, just in front of the cab, which is covered with a, a lid that makes it look a lot like a toolbox. And that's rather well done because it, it disguises it quite nicely. That's about it. The coal space is behind you, just by map with the shovel there. And there's a little inspection hatch just behind that so we can get there. And obviously this comes up as well. We have a little space down there for tools and oil, and then a one the other side behind Matt as well. Show useful little cubby holes. And of course, most importantly, there's a seat for the driver. So with everything on the cab looked at, I suppose we should go around and actually prep this thing and get it ready which means I'm going to get out of my nice clean overalls and put on something a bit more suited for getting grubby. So, grab my oil can, we start off doing all these on the coupling rods. So, a little bit of oil in these, like so. And then we'll try and do the normal thing of not overfilling it. What we've done there is we've just helped lubricate the outside of the bearing and protect it for the future. And finally, the most forward axle, and mm. we've got to fill this up as well. Now, filling these up should last it for a day's work. And here at the railway, it's about a 10 kilometer trip. And then coming back to so 20 kilometers on a standard day, they would do that twice. So that's 40 kilometers that these will quite happily last for which is, yeah, that's not bad. That's not too much mucking around with if they survive through a day's work. That's not too bad. Now, normally on other stuff I've worked on, you have a divot on around here for the brake hangers. These don't have them. They've got race nipples, which makes life a lot easier. We don't need to touch that. And now we're at the front of the engine. We should have a look at the pump. We're making a start on the air pump because obviously air brakes on the continent. This didn't originally have one of these. This has been added, but first thing we need to do is there's a little screw thing behind here which I need to take out, and that will dry in any water in there, of which there appears to be nout. Put that back in, and now we can fill up the reservoir on top here with some more steam oil, which just goes in. That will do that. And now we can stick the lid back on. Now, of course, this is going to have steam pressure behind it, so it's quite important to make sure this is relatively tight. Well, I've got a spanner, whilst of course not over tightening or rounding the nut off, you know, because these are both bad things to do. That would do lovely. Having filled up the top, we've jumped back down onto the ground to fill this little lubricator here, which will actually lube up and oil up the mechanical moving bits of the pump, you know, the actual pumpy bit. So we open the little drain of well, the tap and then fill up this little divot here. With the little lubricator down here slowly draining to fill the bottom half of the pump, we're going to climb up onto the rung board and look at the stuff we need to do going that away. So the first thing we come across here is the little lubricator in here, which is for the slide bars. That's pretty full. And I'm just going to give it a little bit of a top up with some oil. I really wish to take the trimmings out and check that it's all running through, but I'm reliably informed by the owner that it's all working. 
Now we're moving across here to the mechanical lubricator. Now this is a cool thing because it's got both cylinder oil, which is steam oil, which funnily enough feeds the cylinders, this side, and in this compartment, it's bearing oil. We take these off, open them up to reveal these little compartments inside. And both of these have got a little metal sieve filter in it, just to stop the worst bits of, well, grub getting in. Because funny enough, grit and everything like that is the bane of nice metal movie parts. Now we're going to use the nice big cans here because these drink a fair amount of oil. And once we filled this side, put the cover back on, put the lid back on this just in case I send it hurtling groundwards in the hopes that it doesn't spill the oil everywhere. Because uh, that will make me quite unpopular. Put that out of the way and then we've got the steam oils on this side. Which exactly the same principle, only we put steam oil in it. There it is. Steam oil obviously being a lot thicker than lube oil in this slightly chilly day doesn't pour particularly well. And in fact, if it's middle of winter, it doesn't pour at all. It's like trying to well, pour treacle. So we'll put the lid back on that and then screw the catch back on there so it doesn't fly open. Screw the catch back on there so this one doesn't fly open. And then we've got this handle here. Now you can see dropping down below me is the mechanical link that runs off the coupling rod. And so that will drive this pump and turn it around. To prime the system before we start, we turn the handle. And giving this 10 or so turns will help force the oil to all the place it needs to be before we start moving, because otherwise you'll start moving and there won't be any oil there, so you'll be running effectively dry. And the only other thing I need to do now is just put a bit of oil just on the linkage there, there, and there, just to uh, keep that moving nicely. Shuffling myself a bit further along the running board, this is not the ideal way to do this, I'll be honest. Uh, I don't know the ideal way to do it, but sitting like this, definitely not quite ideal. There's a little divot here for the reverser, so we just put a little bit of oil into the divot, like so, and a little run on either side of that. And then we have over here, there's a little box which we fill up with oil, and that's what feeds all the axle boxes. That feeds the rear, the middle, and the front one. So I'm going to chuck a load of oil into that. Oh, that's going to need a lot of oil. Now, apparently, this is the easy way to do these things. We've got a little oil pot here. If I can get the cork out. Let it come. It's working on top of this to get to everything. Because basically, it's accessible from below. Because there's slide bars, pistons, and the valves themselves. So, fill up that little pot like that. Perfect. And then we have another one to do here on the little end, which I am um, not quite. Oh. This lubricator on my side is a lovely addition, but it is rather in the way of everything. Uh, a bit of oil into the little end. Like so. Lovely, lovely, lovely. We slowly fill it up. Oh, come on. Steam engines are so awkward sometimes to work on. There we go. That's full. And back that goes. Right, so there's obviously two more to do. There's the ones there and the one near you. So I'll have to get out and go back and do that your side. While I'm here though, I've got the little oil pot here to fill up. And that is for the slide bars themselves. So that will fill everything up here. How it's, um, they are four pipe ones, but they only have two feeders on them. So it's only the center that I need to fill up which makes life a little bit easier. So no problems there. And then slowly fill it up. Like so, brilliant. And then of course, there's another one on the other side 
There's another one on the other side there, which I'll do when I'm that side. Now we need to move ourselves further back, which I've got the nice squeezy oil can for, because it's going to make life so much easier. I'm just a little bit of oil there. And if I'm really clever, I could probably not hit the camera and fill up that one there. Awesome. Now, underneath that, I've got them to do other divots here for the eccentric where it connects to the link. Go ahead and fill that up. This is very awkward. There we go. And then somewhere in there, I can just about see it, I've got the die block to do, which I can just about position this nice bit of this nice squeezy can. I'd never do this without a squeezy can. So I can fill that up like so. And then I've got that to do at the top of the expansion lake itself. Perfect. So there'll be another one to do at the bottom of the expansion link. And then I've got to clamber inside there to do the big ends and the eccentrics themselves. Now the railway does have a pit and for the life of me, I can't help but feel that maybe that would be easier than what I'm about to try to do. We do have this rather handy grab rail here and having got the certainty that nobody's going to move the poxy thing, Oh, I'm too fat for this. I'm far, far too, Jesus. God. Now I've made a rather schoolboy error in the fact that I've got this far and I haven't got my oil cans with me. <coughs> oh, that is so uncomfortable. Oh, I'm gonna straddle this. Straddle that. Oh, oh that's, um, that's not very comfortable at all. Could I have an oil can, please? Because I have rather made a mistake. Thank you. Right, now I've managed to get myself in here, I've got to try and get to the big end, which is right in front of me. Grab my oil can. Oh, this is so uncomfortable to be sat here. Come on, off you. A competent loco man would be able to remove this cork without having any problem. Oh, there we go. There we go. So we have fill up the big end with a little bit of oil either side to help uh, lubricate the outside, which is very important uh, if you didn't know that already. And lorry top tip, lubricate the outside as well as the inside for uh, looking after stuff for the future. Oh, drop the oil can, brilliant. Then we've got uh, eccentrics across here. Now, I don't know if you realize how difficult this is when you've got a little bit, bit of metal between your legs but uh, it's not the most comfortable of positions nor is it particularly easy to um, focus how on earth am I going to get the oil into there now I know a lot of you especially our American viewers will be looking at this going well, why is everything on the inside and frankly at this moment in time I'm wondering exactly the same thing now, it makes locomotives ride a lot nicer, it makes everything a bit smoother, having all your mass of things spinning around on the inside, and it makes the outline a lot more you know, aesthetically pleasing. As this was a war locomotive, oh, a war design, I have absolutely no idea why they didn't go for something with outside cylinders. Absolutely none, because it would have made everything so much easier. I found I can stand up and that is saving my undercarriage a great deal. Now there's quite a big reserve on the big end so that takes a fair bit of oil. There we go. Fill that up beautifully. Right, so we'll just get that last eccentric out. And then finally, got to get my oil can and there's a little divot just in there to do. Perfect. Having done the bottom of the expansion link back there, that concludes oiling up on that side. I now need to repeat the entire procedure on this side with the exclusion of the air pump because there's only one of those. But in order to do the oiling up on this side, 
I need to get back out. And that's going to be a challenge, I think. Our top is working its way into my bottom. Uh. How did I get into this? I have no understanding of how I did this. Um, uh. <laughs> 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 and that is how you gracefully get out of the inside of a locomotive. Uh, right, now we're in the cab, we've only got a couple of things to lubricate. So starting here, we have a hydrostatic lubricator which sends steam oil down to the valve chest. So grabbing something to stop myself being scalded by the heat, we make sure that's off. Then we grab this handy spanner which I'm told will fit. One end will fit. Now we can crack the, the nut there, and then oh, cool, that is. there we go, release the drain nicely and see if there's any water behind that. We can now take the nut off the whole way, which is quite warm, and see about putting some more steam wall in there. That's quite warm. And then touch around here, we have a little thing of steam wall. It's just warming up to make it a little more runny, which makes life a lot easier. And then we can just fill that up to the lip, like so. <laughs> now, once we're running, before we start going, we'll set this up, we'll turn it on, and then we've got tap down there and a little view viewing gallery there so we can adjust the speed of which the oil comes out and the other thing I've got to do is just put a little bit of oil down in that divot there behind the regulator to lubricate that and that will be it prepped and now we're ready to go take the thing for a drive Here we go. Brake off. Gently ease open the regulator. Listen for the steam. Listen for the valves to seal themselves. There we go. Let a bit of steam build. And away we go. Now I believe this is the biggest locomotive that I've actually featured on the channel. And it's certainly the most powerful. And frankly, the austerity has always been a locomotive that I've loved. It's such a stereotypical design. It's something that when you think of a steam engine, you think of an austerity, or at least I do. Shut the cylinder cocktail, we're going. And so actually to get a go driving one, it's, it's a bit of a dream come true, to be honest. And I know lots of you will be like, really, an austerity? But... <laughs> That's a great whistle. That's a really, really lovely whistle. We'll give it a little bit more. Oh, we'll knock you back one. So it's also very nice to actually be taking a train on a decent run. This is a 10 kilometer run. And so to actually go for a drive this long, it's really nice. So the first thing to take from this, the regulator. I can rock it back and forth a bit, there's a bit of slack, but it means it's really controllable because you can use that momentum just to nudge it over a tiny bit, giving you an immense amount of control. And it's a very satisfying bark when you open it up as well. She is perfectly in time. I've driven a lot of locomotives with off-beat and this one just is absolutely on the button. It's fantastic. We're going to shut off, lock it into forward again and we'll just keep rolling for a bit. So the first thing as well to take from initial impressions is it rides amazingly. I've been on some other six coupled engines with short wheel bases like this and they have the habit to buck and jump around a bit and it could well be the track here being very good. But it's just lovely, it's like gliding along. It's almost like we're levitating above the rails. It is superb. It's just glorious. And the next thing is, there's no noise. 
apart from the sound of the exhaust, there's no squeaks, there's no banging. Everything on this is absolutely, well, it's absolutely top notch. Initial thoughts, she is one of the best conditioned locomotives that I've ever had the pleasure, well, to drive full stop. I mean, certainly it's one of the best conditioned locomotives that I've featured on the channel. It's certainly on par, maybe even better than uh, 813 that I visit, that I did all. About this time last year, in fact. But everything is perfect. Nothing on the back plate here leaks. Nothing anywhere else seems to leak. There's no banging, there's no crack. Everything feels tight. It is. I cannot stress how good the loco is. The other really nice thing is the owner absolutely adores it and spends a lot of time looking after it, working on the brasses, just generally looking after it and cleaning it. And so she appears absolutely mint. It's almost like it's fresh out the box. And I know the owner is exceptionally proud of it. So a massive thank you to, to him for letting us, well, inviting us over and letting us have a go with his pride and joy. Because it is very much his pride and joy. The chap is married and I don't know who comes first. Honestly, guys, it, it could well be the engine. Now, with an austerity, the most notable thing looking forward is there is a rather large tank in the way. My visibility looking forward is, well, somewhat compromised. There is a lot of engines that you can single man and crew on your own. Austerity, no. Definitely, definitely need at least a fireman watching out that side because I am blind quite a lot that side. So we're coming up to a signal now. And I lose sight of the signal now. I'm just going to keep talking and so you know, talk amongst yourselves and I'll let you know when the signal actually goes past. Not that we're going particularly fast, but I have no idea of anything that's down there at all. It's, um, it certainly feels a big engine. There, that was the signal there. We've got a, a train behind us, but now the next thing we're going to do is give the brakes a, a try and see how effective they are without knocking all the passengers over. So it's going to be a very gentle brake. Oh, you feel them biting. Just a very quick application of the brake results in quite a lot slowing down. Oh, they bite there. That's a lot. One thing I would say for the engine, no doors, no side panels. There is a lot of wind today and it is coming straight through the cab. So we've now got into a bit of shelter from the trees behind me and I'm not being blown away, which is good. So we're just going to open it up a bit and enjoy the noise. So all forward gear and... <laughs> it's such a nice noise. It's, it's so amazingly in beat. She is a really, really cracking piece of kit. It's just got that kind of big engine noise. It doesn't sound like a small engine chopping away. That's a big engine guttural noise that's a that's a sound of power and it's a real smile making machine it is something really good now i'm sure i mentioned it before but it's a really nice large spacious cab on this for an engine of this size there's plenty of space to move around to be able to fire there's plenty of space to be able to do that and it's just it's a good space to be 
the farmin and the driver on top of each other. There's room for a cleaner to be in here as well. It's actually, it's all pretty good. And also my position here, I'm stood presently with my foot up, leg up on the step for the reverser, which makes it knock you back. And it's just a really nice driving position. I'm resting against the back of the cab. Feels good, feels good. Everything is nicely within my reach. Include the new control unit here with all the electrical gubbins and the electrical lights. It's all just here, both brakes right next door to me, regulator right here. Everything is in easy reach. I don't need to throw myself around at all. And that's nice, it's just an easy engine to use. And of course, the only thing that's slightly strange for me on this is we get the sound of the air pump working, which I'm just not used to. Most of the stuff I drive on a regular basis isn't air brakes. It's a very continental noise, but it's, it's quite pleasant. It brings back happy memories of being in Poland. And now, of course, we get my favourite thing is we're coming up to an ungated, unalarmed crossing, which means... <laughs> makes me so happy. Clear my side. Clear that side, good. And now you can hear the air pump coming in. So I've done quite a, a bit of braking there to slow us down for this crossing. Gently pull away. It's such a satisfying noise and satisfying being on top of all this power. Well, wow. honestly, it's a little bit intoxicating. So behind me at the moment, we've got somewhere in the regions of 190 tons. And she is not bothered in the least. I mean, it's designed to take a lot more. It's designed to move quite heavy trains. And God, you feel that it should. You feel like it would just walk away with trains. I mean, this is a very level railway as well. Oh. And there is just nothing here to tax this locomotive at all. And I mean, the sensation on this is fantastic. And I, I've got to be honest, driving a British engine in Belgium gives me a real kind of feel of national pride. It's kind of, it's out here doing exactly what it was meant to do, moving things around. And I am very happy about that. I like it when people in cars smile and wave at you. That makes me feel happy. They understand the power. It's cars somewhere down here, steam locomotives up here. It's good when people respect that. And certainly, I am very jealous of this locomotive. This is kind of like my dream engine. It's as big as I think I could realistically ever have. And kind of lets me sample what my dream is to have one of these to be out driving it today. And again, the worst thing is the owner's a really nice guy as well. Can't even hate him for it. The locomotive really does need some sliders. I, I on Great Western engines, they've got shutters that come across on the side of the cab. And this one could really do with that. That's the basically the only improvement, the only thing I don't like. It even has seats. So if I get tired, I can sit down on the job. Which is lovely. Really does help the mod cons. better way to spend the day than trundling through Belgium on a British steam engine on a fairly lustry and miserable day and I'm quite happy and warmly exhausted to the fire. There is very little which would beat this to be honest guys, very little. Of course one of the best things about an austerity is it is quite literally the locomotive you can take anywhere. It's small enough to work on the small heritage railways and big enough and with enough reserve of water in that tank to handle even the biggest. It is a go anywhere, do anything locomotive. It's brilliant. And I think that these things were built 
in the war, you know, the austerity, a quick to build, simple locomotive. And there's still so many of them kicking about, still doing more or less what they were built for. Shows what a good bit of design it is. And the only thing I really feel with this is today is quite pleasant, but I want to take this somewhere. I want to take this to Foxfield and storm up the bank in that and really see what it would do. Because you just get this sensation that it could do so much more. It's almost wasted. Not quite, but almost wasted. And it's just, it's the little touches I like on this as well. Like the switches coming out of the World War II aircraft. They're nice. It's a nice little tie-in back to the War Department days. The fact the battery box on the side has been done up with WD on it to just really tie in. It's just so many little touches that help to make this so nice. And of course, the favourite thing is the little bit of artwork here on the side of the cab. A little homage back to Oda's wife. Watching over me today, as well as the owner watching me from the other side of the cab, giving me the, the death look every time I do something wrong, is his wife, and she's my fireman. Fire lady. I'm not sure what the correct PC term is, but it's quite nice on the husband and wife power team, the owner team, being here to watch over. And yeah, it's lovely having a lady in the hobby as well. Would I hub this engine? Yes, yes I would. I would bite anybody's hands off who were going to offer me something like this. In fact, if the owner wasn't looking and we'd bought a bigger car with us, I'd put it in the back of the car and take it home. It is quite possibly my favorite locomotive that I've ever driven. And part of that is because it's so good. Part of it because it's so iconic. And a little bit of it is it's the locomotive out of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And that makes me very happy. So that's the end of this review of this rather lovely little austerity. I have had an absolutely marvellous time. It really is a joy to drive. It may well be my favourite locomotive that I've ever had a go on. It really is just that good. And I am rather jealous of the owner and he should be very proud of it. So a massive, massive thank you to the owners for letting me have a go on the engine. It has been such an honour. And a massive thank you to the Maldingham to Eagle Steam Railway for letting us come along. It's a really super railway. And if you like what you've seen here, the website is in the video description. Have a look. And there's also the links there. If you really like what you've seen, you'd like to get involved and learn how to operate this locomotive, the links to volunteer are there as well. And I highly recommend it because it's awesome. And for this, well, it's turned into a rather mucky, horrible day here. It started off nasty, got nice and now nasty again. That's it for us. So thank you very much, guys. Please, if you've enjoyed this video, like the video, subscribe if you haven't already. Share the video with your railway friends or your non-railway friends. Annoy them with more train content and leave a comment. Let us know how much you've enjoyed this. And remember, guys, that we uh, have a Discord as well. The description for that's in the video description. So if you want to get involved and chat to us, that's a really good place to chat about things like trains, cars, tractors, all that sort of stuff. And we stream on Mondays on Twitch, watching Jeffrey try to crash a car. It's a good opportunity to talk to the rest of the crew. We're there sometimes talking. So if you want to come along and chat to us, a good opportunity there. In the meantime, if you've enjoyed this video, how about clicking up there somewhere for one of the other videos we've done on a Belgian locomotive in the UK, a bit of a role reversal, or down there for a standard gauge diesel, one that we did over at the Duent Valley earlier in the year. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you later.